This is Lausche Lawrence McElroy here with another live Facebook session on a Tuesday morning at 1015. I think our first one was March 24th. So we've been at this a while and probably will be a while longer. Um, so first a word, you know, this is, um, although primarily for everyone in the greater community in this time of COVID-19 and the coronavirus crisis, um, we set this time and this day of the week because of our currently suspended ongoing long-term uh, public class at West Babylon Public Library. This is the time when in non-COVID times we would be starting class. So here we are starting a little workshop. Um, so if you've been participating in these, if you've been following them on Facebook, um, and you were part of last week or was watching last week's video after the session, um, you probably caught that there was some sort of technical issue. Uh, I was about three quarters of the way through uh, the workshop on Tai Chi Shigong warming up. Well, not warming up. It's now Tai Chi Shigong uh, reeling silk, uh, rotating the ball. And all of a sudden, my screen went blank. It was just a blacked out screen where I monitor, you know, what I what it is that I'm presenting um, with a message from Facebook. Says, We're sorry, but at this time, we seem unable to play your video. Uh, I had no idea as it was going on uh, if I was still streaming live uh, video and audio, uh, which, of course, I was. So I attempted uh, to fix it and explain what I was doing in case I was still on camera, and I was. And if you haven't watched the end of last week's part one video, you really should, because I look as confused as I felt. <laughs> My facial expression is, shall we say, priceless. Uh, but anyway, after I figured out I there wasn't anything that I could see that I could do, I shut down the video abruptly, and I reopened another one. So there is a second part to last Tuesday morning. That's the short story of the long story I'm telling, that if you haven't caught the second part, the end of that workshop, you may want to go back and find it in the uh, in the video section uh, on Water Tiger School's Facebook page. Um, so there's that. I also need to wish you all, I suppose, a happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, I did see a meme the other day that I found sort of amusing, and it's like, uh, wouldn't you know it <clears throat> that uh, this year we have Cinco de Mayo, on Taco Tuesday, and it's more or less been canceled because of a virus that has the same name as a Mexican beer. So go figure. I suppose um, a certain singer songwriter in the 80s would say, isn't that ironic? Um, but anyway, so today, today we're gonna have a little, oh, hi Colette. Um, today we're gonna have a little workshop, a little warm up, and we're going to play uh, with directions. Now there's going to be sort of a, little simple talk about direction and something a little bit more complex. Um, and we'll just, you know, we'll see how it goes and see how the day unfolds. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to get another drink. <clears throat> As always, I'm thirsty in the morning. Uh, so for our warm up today, we're going to do something uh, from the nine temple exercises, it's called uh, grinding the grain. We're gonna start with a little shake. Just cause the studio class, the remote studio class this morning, the warm up started with huggers. You know, most of you, if you've been in any of my programs, you know, huggers <sighs> started doing that. And I really didn't want to qu quit, it's sort of like the shaking is sometimes. So, grinding the grain. Simple in its complexity, complex in its simplicity. Um, more or less, you're doing exactly what the name suggests, which is grinding the grain. So we have a grinding table. We have to set the height of the grinding table, a height that we can maintain. Because there's a squat involved, and we have to hold that squat. Um, while we squat, a couple of things, toes and knees are going to track the same direction. So, you know, you can be wider than shoulder wide. I usually am in this exercise. Regardless of the width of the stance, you want to remember that when you're squatting, toes and knees should track the same direction. So if I'm less open in the qua, where the inner upper thigh comes into contact with the pelvic bowl, then my toes are probably going to be forward, which means as I squat, I shouldn't push my knees out away from my center line, or for that matter, into them. 
but they should track the same direction as the toes. If I'm a little bit more open in the quad, toes are gonna be out. And as I squat, that's the direction that my toes are going to go. Yes, I added the plural on purpose. The other thing to remember, weight to the heels when I squat. That, that doesn't matter if the toes are forward or the toes are back. I'm not rocking the weight into the balls of my feet, but back to the heels. Now we do various squatting exercises. A um, couple of them in the nine, in the not the nine temple exercises, in the eight pieces of brocade, the standing eight pieces of brocade. We squat, but we're squatting in a way that keeps the shoulders over the hips. In this exercise, I'm squatting to find the surface of the table, but notice my back, if I'm on my game, should be a launching ramp. I'm not collapsing the spine. So I'm like a launching ramp to find the height of my grinding table. Now, the original instructions in the nine temple exercises uh, include uh, the idea or the standard that my table should be the height of my knees. I think somebody else said hi. Uh, that's Rich. Good morning, Rich. Um, I don't even maintain that depth. Not that I'm like some superstar or something. I tend to be a little bit higher. I think the primary reason that they specified the knees as the height in the original instructions in the source material is that that gives you a very clear marker for the height of your hands. So wherever that is in your bend over, you sort of want to track where that is on your hips, on your thighs, to your knees. Absolutely don't go below, below the knees. So you maintain the same height as your table. It's very important to have a realistic height. You know, I'm not, as I'm moving, the hand height shouldn't change. We refer to that instead of grinding the grain as massaging the blob. Uh, so that's kind of the basis of it. The more you make the table in your mind, in other words, feel the surface of the table, its temperature. My visual image actually goes to my hands aren't on the table themselves. They're on grinding stones on the surface of the table. So as I do the exercise, I seek to feel the grain giving way under the pressure of my hands and the grinding stones. Um, so there's that. So I feel the grinding stones. I feel their relationship with the table and the grain. All of that. The more real you make that image in your mind, the more real it's going to become for your body. One of the things you can do to help with this exercise, to develop this exercise, is find a surface table that is, about, is at about the right height for you that you establish your grinding table and then play right over the surface of the table, you know. Uh, for instance, the table on which I have the laptop that's uh, doing the video portion of uh, the presentation is really at about the right height for me. So I would stand, I would pull it out, I would set it so my hands can float right over the surface of the table because it's a little bit easier to see on that surface of the table if one hand starts to come up or you run into the table by the other hand going down. But the hand should be at the same height throughout. It's not an angled table, it's a flat surface table. So there's that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind within that movement is I actually imagine that my table has a little U cut out of it. So I step into the table and that way I can round around my hips a little bit. Um, the arm movement, they're moving in two different directions. Huh, we're going to focus on plain Tai Chi in different directions, and we're doing an exercise that will have the two hands moving in different directions at the same time. I wonder if there's any method to my madness. So the left hand's always going to be moving counterclockwise. Not really round, because as you saw, I'm going around the hips, so it's sort of an elongated, circular-like configuration. The right hand's always going to be moving clockwise. So you can kind of put the points of a clock on the floor below you, 12, 6, 9, and 3, 
and know that they're both going to be at nine at the same time. One's going to be at 12. One's going to be at six. They're going to, both going to be at three, more or less at the same time. And as I move from side to side, a couple other things. I'm not shifting my weight over to the right and over to the left. I'm keeping my perineum, my hu yin, dead center between my feet. I'm still going to feel a little bit of emphasis go to the left leg as I twist to the left and the right leg as I twist to the right, and that's okay. But I'm just not shifting my weight from one side to the other. Uh, there's something else in that that I was going to say. Uh, I'm not sure what it was. So we're going to start. Find the surface of your table. Again, back is straight. Oh, now I know what it was. Be careful of reaching too far out away from you for the outer hand, for the hand that's at 12 when the other hand's at six. I'm staying in close. See that nice bend to the elbow? Even with the hand that's farther away. The more I reach out, oh look, there's my other hand. You can see it because my front hand has risen. You wanna keep it down, so keep it closer. Breathe, relax, settle in. Breathe when you have to. I might suggest a breath pattern as we get going. So start to feel that pressing, that little isometrics pressing into the surface of the table. And you may also notice how as you're doing that, you can feel perhaps an activation that starts to rise up into the solar plexus region, into the mid back. You're also working, of course, your thighs and your legs, activating the quad, the glutes, the shoulders and the chest as you press down. There's a lot going on here. We're gonna go over to the right. Well, over to one side, I'm not gonna say which. One hand is farther away than the other. The one that's going, the direction that I'm going, that's the hand that's farther away. So as I turn to that side, the hand on that side is farther away from the body. The one that's I'm turning away from is closer to. They switch position, coming back through. Maybe an exhalation as you complete the twist to the side, an inhalation in through the center. Perhaps an exhalation. As you move through the center, and as you move over to the side in an inhalation, as you come to the center, exhale, pressing down, inhale, exhale, but breathe when you have to. I believe that was about three pair. I think we'll go to six, four, maybe more, I think nine. Five pair. I'm notorious for not being able to count and talk at the same time. Grinding the grain. Feel the surface of the table. Three more pair, including this one. Actually, now I think it's three more pair, including this one. Two more pair. Last pair. After this one. I know I keep adding, coming back to the center and standing up out of it. And that oh, is grinding the grain. So if you're down in that squat as long as I was, more power to you, man. See, I'm breathing. I'm breathing because when we squat, this is two really big muscle groups in the legs. And when we squat, it activates up through the torso. Your lungs and your heart begin to work a little bit harder, um, getting the blood and the oxygen going. So grinding the grain from the nine temple exercises, from the water tiger school's approach to the nine temple exercises. So different directions. Now, the basics of different directions, in other words, sort of the easier of the two views, is what I want you to do on a regular basis is whatever your practice space is, face a different way. So if you're always, you know, like I'm doing in these uh, presentations, I'm pretty much always facing forward as I'm playing things. So I always have the same landmarks. So the basic you can do with walking exercises. 
which is if you're always facing, you know, the front of the room when you do your walking exercise, you know, turn, maybe you have less space, you know, the mats, my exercise mats are longer forward to back than they are side to side. But now I have a different perspective. I have different landmarks. So as I'm moving through my basic walking exercises, things change up. Um, do an angle, right? When you're facing cardinal directions as you're doing a walking exercise. So pick an angle. We'll do a little bit of rails. So rails, you set your railroad tracks. Again, at an angle, it's a different perspective on what it is you're doing. This is another in the series of exercises um, that I would call variety is the spice of Tai Chi or variety is the spice of practice. So I'm still gonna be shoulder wide regardless of walking at an angle or not. My hands are still gonna be in one of their five places, belly over the Shia Dantian acupuncture point, back, palm down, lightly closed fists, wrists forward, not in, not up, or hands on the hips. And settle the weight still at this point into the right foot and step to the left. So we wanna change our perspective because otherwise a lot of times the recognition of where we are in the form comes from an external physical cue, where I am in the room, where I am in the yard, what tree am I seeing? That whether or not my feet are parallel or if I'm doing a Tai Chi stance walk, one more step so I can lose being the headless Tai Chi player a little casual close. So you have to internalize and own your walking exercise exercises and your forms more if you change your landscape by changing the direction. Now, like everything we do, opinions vary about every aspect of changing the direction of your play. Because there are those who will say, and justifiably so, I mean, I understand their argument that you always face one direction and move primarily in either one direction or the opposite direction as you're playing Tai Chi. Um, in other words, like with the 24, generally speaking, now there is some difference here too, and we'll get to that in a second, that if you're playing the 24, you open facing the north, and your first step is to the west uh, and to the left. And that's it. And that's based on the rotation of the earth and the flow of chi in the greater environment on the planet. Now, there are those who will say, regardless of northern or southern hemisphere, you should always face the north. But there are also people who will say, if you're playing a form and you're in the southern hemisphere, you should face the south when you open and your first step is to the east you still it would still be it would be just the opposite if i'm i'm pretending this is north uh it's not that's north yes um so if i was in the southern hemisphere i face the south pole i would still open stepping out to the left but instead of stepping to the west i'd step to the east and the people who hold that opinion um, base, it, base, base it within the fact that if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and, you know, for instance, um, you're letting a sink drain, the water going down the drain is going to spin clockwise. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere and you're letting a sink drain, the water is going to spin counterclockwise. So that's the reason for that difference. I'm sort of the, of the always face North uh, opinion. Uh, I understand that change in the physics of water drainage and that sort of thing and non-attached items will move in the opposite direction, I think is sort of the basis of that. Um, but um, think about that, non-attached items. Yes, we are standing on the earth, but if we're playing Tai Chi and we're on the earth and not in the earth, there's something wrong. So that's sort of my thinking there. You feel free to disagree. Um, but anyway, so people have their set opinions about the direction. 
um, not only walking exercise, but to me, forms. I mean, yes, generally I say when you're playing, face the north, open, and play to the west first. But you need to change your direction. I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, who have gotten to the point in a form where you've closed for the first time in either a public class or a studio class, uh, and I've asked you or directed you or led you to open the form facing a different direction in the room, oh my gosh, it was like the hardest thing ever. Uh, and if you are always only playing, facing the same landmarks every time, that's going to happen. And it shouldn't be the case. You should always mix things up. Which brings us to our second level of changing direction. So walking exercises, this really doesn't matter because as you're doing a walking exercise, you're constantly switching between a step to the left and a step to the right. So you're always playing. If I'm doing parting the wild horse's mane, uh, it doesn't matter you know, at this point which way I face. You know, you're going to take a left step. You're going to take a right step. And you're playing everything to both sides. But what happens when I get to something, you know, within the form or even the opening? When we open a form, generally speaking, within the Water Tiger School lineage anyway, you know, that opening... Hands on the belly, left over the right, right over the left. That doesn't change in any of the things that, about which I'm talking. Whichever hand feels like it belongs next to the body is for you, the one that belongs there. Anyway, the hands drop down. We settle the weight into the right foot, right? So from that neutral, double-weighted position, hands drop down, weight settles into the right foot. Hands separate, feet separate. That left foot goes out, but it's unweighted and still vertically aligned over that right foot. As the hands float up, I center the body between the two feet. As I come in, the heel starts to descend. As I descend, reconnecting to the earth. Up a second time. And every time we open almost every form, with or without a twist, I'm going to twist on the ball of the right foot, weighted or unweighted, so it'll weight into the right. Oops, a little glitch there. And step to the left for my first posture. Now in... The 24, our first posture, this is our parting the wild horse's mane. Within our lineage, we also have, from that position, a four-posture short form using the postures of grass sparrow still. So we might move into word off in Water Tiger School's grass sparrow's head sequence. Or there's uh, a short form, an even shorter form, cloud hands and horse's mane, where there's no twist, there's no pivot, but I do still settle the weight into the right foot. And my first step in the form and my first wave hands like clouds is to the left. So we refer to that in Water Tiger School as playing the form to the left. And the reason we say that that's the case, that we are playing to the left, is that that first major step is to the left. There are other people who would say that the way in which I just demonstrated the opening of a handful of our forms is actually playing to the right. And they're right to say so, just as I feel I'm right to say that the other is true. What they judge the direction on is that very first move. And in all of those, the, in the three openings, in the opening of our long form, it's the same thing. In the opening of our staff, our sword, or our jian, straight sword and dao, a knife or broadsword or saber, it's all the same. The weight settles into the right foot first. So they say that's the form to the right because that's the first move. Perfectly understandable. I believe the first major step as the marker is also perfectly understandable. Uh, so anyway. Those are the forms to the left. You want to mix things up and change your perspective. And again, folks have a different opinion about this. And what you do 
is what we just did. If everybody does the same opening with me, at least, right? Now, again, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters for you where the hands are, but I don't designate which hand is over which. Whichever hand feels like it belongs next to your body is from Water Tiger School perspective, the one that belongs there. And it may be different the next time. And you may actually feel a need when you change direction to change the hands. And if you feel that need, follow it. So now, as the hands drop down, the weight settles into the left foot. Not the right, but the left foot. As the hands separate, the right foot goes out. My vertical alignment remains over the ball of the left foot. Up over the center of the feet. Centering the body between the feet. In, heel starts to descend, down, heel descends. Rising up a second time. Pressing down a second time, this time pressing the weight and doing a weighted or an unweighted turn into the ball of the left foot. Left hand comes into the top of the ball, right hand into the bottom, I step to the right. And there's my first parting the wild horse's mane or ward off or whatever in that direction. So there's one. There's two. And now on three, within the 24, we have our transition into white crane. So I have that little forming the ball, but this time twisting to the right. That left foot comes in. I do my high press to the left, the right leg comes up, the hands go down, and I'm in white crane, spreads its wings, with the left hand up and the right hand down. Nine times out of 10, for most folks, the issues arise in those single-legged moments. So there are more issues at white crane spreads its wings, at play in the pay paw, moving into the prep for snake creeps down, et cetera. But just like opening in the 24, white crane is only played once. And it's always played, again, our transition into white crane is a little bit more um, <clears throat> involved than others. For a lot of people, what they'll do is get that third party in wild horses made and simply set back. There's actually a floor exercise that we do, a taste of the 24, that we do that, right? Um, there are also people who will do the same rock back as the previous or whatever their transition is, however they transition from party in the wild horses made to party in the wild horses made. They'll form the ball again. They'll step out and they'll move into white crane. Regardless of how you get into white crane, moving into one leg, playing to the opposite direction is tough. Why? Because we always only get into it one way. And if we don't play with it the other direction, we don't have that experience. Plus, when you play to the opposite direction, for us, play to the right, if you find little glitches, little lacks of surety in your movement at different points, those probably, not always, but probably point to something that's not quite as solid as you think it is when you're playing the form in the regular direction. So again, you know, however you get into white crane, you know, we normally, oops, I was starting to do the rock back thing again, boom up to the right, down, and settling in. So it's a much different experience if you come to that from a right force stance, and very much Chan C, twisting, forming the ball to the right side of the body, bringing the left foot in to that 45, dropping the left heel, picking up the right heel, and high press to the left, hands drop down, and a lot of people will get to this point and want to raise the right hand because that's what they normally do. But it's the left hand. I'm going to turn to the right. Coming back in. For us, remember that what we refer to as the sky hook moment when the 
right hand gets to the right knee, it's going to bring it in, and you do your first brush knee. So everything that's done constantly in one direction, when you play in your primary direction, again, for us, it's the left, then when you play to the right, um, to the opposite direction, the other direction, it is also, ah, um, it is also um, changed. So you get to play it the other way. Someone just commented, it's like, I'm so glad you can't see me because I just messed that up. Uh, gee, what a surprise, right? It takes some time. And what you do as you're playing through your form, whatever it is, you know, our grass sparrows total the four cardinal directions. We play the four postures to one side. We play the four postures to the opposite. And then we have a major transition. So we go, we play the four postures more or less the way that we play them in the 24. And then we have to come and face the front. And we step back and through in the normal way and play into the left with the left foot. Pivot, pivot, and come in. And then play grass sparrow's tail and grass sparrow's tail. So when we open to the right, instead of being in a right four stance in push at the end of the first section of the form, we're in a left four stance in push, which means I have to keep in mind, I'm turning to the front, forming the ball, left hand's the top of the ball, right hand's the bottom, step back and through with the right foot, right hand up, left hand down, left toes around, right toes around, and come back in. So when you hit those moments, white crane, and, and you're like, okay, you're in the right four stance, and like, okay, um, no, that's not, no, I, it's, I, okay. So then you go back, you know, all right, so here I am. Sort of dropping away in the left foot, left hand to the top of the ball, right hand to the bottom. Okay. Dropping away in the, no, not the left foot, the right foot, right hand's the top of the ball, left hand's the bottom of the ball. And you start to move into it. And you get to this point, and that's fine. You get to this point, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not. Maybe you get to that point and you do this. Then you go back, and it's like, okay, so I'm here, here, right foot's behind. Heels up, twisted to the left, and I'm moving to the opposite direction. So I'm, I'm sort of moving from this diagonal to that diagonal. So that means if I'm over here, I'm moving from this diagonal to that diagonal. And break it down. Go back and forth between the two. So you have an opportunity to sort of figure out, to map it out a little bit, get a little bit comfortable with it, and then put it back in the context of the form. And then play to the next time you get stopped. And then take some time, tear it apart. I have probably shared in this series, maybe on the YouTube channel, and some of the things that I presented there. You know, that very important observation that came up, up on the mat, I'd say probably 14, 15 years ago from a senior student at the time. I uh, said, you know, sometimes the only way to put it together is take it apart. And that's good advice. Um, many times, and it's one of the reasons that I am really emphasizing the idea of variety in our approach to our play, is that we tend to learn our form in segments. So either our, either our form to date or our form from beginning to closing and once we get to that part point, we never take it apart again. We get to those sticking points, even when we're just playing in the regular direction and we feel that something's off. And it's like, oh, I'll just pay that more attention to that the next time I play the form. I suggest strongly pull it out, play with it a little bit. Don't work at it. Don't try to drive that obstinate nail into the hard wood play with it like a puppy would an unguarded slipper. There's Linda Maioki Lairhop again, sticking her nose in where it belongs um, from uh, Tai Chi is a Path of Wisdom. Can't emphasize that book enough. Um, and then, you know, go back, you know? So 
play with the different directions. It took me a long time in one particular moment in the form, um, in all of my forms then, because it was opening. It was, well, except for Cloud Hands and Horses Mane, because there's no weight shift. But it was, you know, boom, 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 up and over, this. It feels so smooth, so connected, so natural, regardless of what form I'm starting. And it took a long time in my plane to the right. Suddenly weight to the left, no problem. Stepping out that right foot, no problem. No worries whatsoever. Well, there should ne never be any worries regardless. But this moment, turning on the ball of that right of that left foot and settling in, it's really that turn and moving into the first posture. I almost did ward off from Grass Barrow's tail there. Took me a long time. And if I don't play to the right on a relatively regular basis, that little catch will return a little bit. I felt it this morning because I, I have been playing Grass Barrow's tail to the right a little bit more because um, we just introduced a student to that um in the remote environment so it's been fun um but anyway um so it's a little bit smoother but it could be smoother still um and in, about it, it's good that i mentioned introducing a new student to it um and maybe something i should have said initially another place where opinions vary on this particular approach to our practice is that uh, I've read essays by people who do support this particular idea, but have written, have suggested that it is not done until somebody's really fully, absolutely comfortable with the form and all their aspects and they have everything together and they've been practice, practicing a full form from opening to close for, I can't remember if, um, person that I'm thinking of, the essay that I'm thinking of was like a year or two years or something like that. So a really long time. Um, I do it relatively soon. And then once people start to experience that in our process, in our studio process anyway, because we have multiple forms that we get through uh, in the studio game, in the studio process, as they start to learn another form, they start to sort of intermingle um, right and left play. Uh, it also comes in handy when you do another walking exercise that we do at, at Water Tiger School. And that's what we refer to as the Tai Chi walk improv, where you go from step to step without a plan of what comes next. And things play out in, in an order that they normally wouldn't. So, you know, you begin your walking exercise and your first posture is parting the wild horses man. And then maybe your second posture is brushing you step and strike. And your third posture is repulse the monkey. That was kind of a crappy repulse the monkey. And your fourth posture is a movement into wave hands like clouds. That was really bad there. So there's no set pattern, which means you could find yourself some, at some point in a, well, it doesn't really matter which direction I do brush knee, but let's say it's a left brush knee and it's like, okay, I'm gonna step out into um, a white crane. And I did something there that I really don't want to do in improv is that at the end of that, because we'd normally do brush knee, I don't wanna do another brush knee. I don't wanna do brush knee because that's what we normally come out of in, in white crane. So I'm seeking to let go of, again, prescribed movement and go into something that wouldn't normally fit in that particular moment. Um, so that gives you an opportunity to experience playing things both on the right side and the left side. I believe that's it. So play with it, have fun with it explore, change your perspective. The more we change up the way in which we approach our play, 
the deeper our understanding of our art uh, we can cultivate. So a little variety is the spice of Tai Chi, is the spice of practice. I'm just going to see if I can see what time it is. I'll grab my glasses here for a moment. Oh, okay. That time went fast. I was like, you know, and I want to give them more than 15, 20 minutes. And I guess I've done that. So um, I do want to mention, you may have noticed, this is one of my favorite shirts. I've owned it for a long time. Um, the Zen Bear, uh, created by Terry Dunn, doing the 24 posture form. This is my favorite. It's the pooped panda position. Um, Zen Bear, by the way, came out uh, long, long before Po and the Kung Fu Panda. Um, um, the Zen Bear was created by Terry Dunn. And there is information online that um, uh, Mr. Dunn had presented the idea of Zen Bear as an animated featured film or television series to folks, uh, powers that be, and was declined. And then all of a sudden there was Poe. Uh, I haven't investigated. I don't know the whole story, but I thought I'd mention it because I was wearing the shirt. But I love the shirt. Uh, it's been doing Tai Chi for almost as long as I have. You might be able to tell, or at least if you were in person, you'd probably be able to tell. So there you go. This week, um, and next week, we'll be back. Uh, say to them. Program again. This, these are for everybody, but uh, for the folks in the suspended program at Sachem on Mondays at 10 a.m. Uh, and here for West Babylon and others on Tuesdays at 10:15. Not sure where things stand with West Babylon at this time, as far as the reopening process. Um, I have been in discussion with them about certain possibilities, but that's all I um, feel comfortable in saying at this time. Um, don't hold your breath. Well, there are probably times these days that you should hold your breath. Unless you're wearing a mask, then you're probably okay. Um, but anyway, we'll see what happens with West Babylon. I know if you weren't tuning in yesterday morning, uh, Sachin Public Library reached out over the weekend. Um, they are still closed until further notice. And regardless of when they might be considering reopening, they have suspended uh, public offering programs, so like our Tai Chi program, uh, through the month of July. Um, so I'm, we'll, we'll be here for a while, live on Mondays and Tuesdays. And uh, I think that's it for today. So wash your hands. As I mentioned before, wear a mask if you're outside, especially, in, well, I'm just going to say if you're outside, wear a mask uh, where people will be. Um, stop touching your face if you haven't washed your hands. And Let's keep listening um, to those that know, and that would be, uh, of course, medical professionals and scientists as to when uh, we can take the next steps uh, moving forward. And uh, Boucher, Rich Black, uh, for your thank you. I guess that's it. So take care, um, have fun, play. Remember that puppy with the unguarded slipper, that's savoring a fine glass of wine instead of hammering at the obstinate nail. And we'll see you next time.